Now, I don't think it's ever happened to me before, although it might have, but I, I can't recall it's having happened, that I found myself lecturing on a person who had lectured yesterday here at Yale. <laughs> but that's what happened in this case. Uh, you read, um, let's just call it the facetious article on the lecture in the Daily News this morning. Uh, some of you may actually have been in attendance. Um, I unfortunately could not be, uh, but as it happened, I ran into her later in the evening and talked to some of her colleagues about what she'd said, so I, I, I do have um, uh, a, certain sense, a certain sense of what went on. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, and, and as to what went on, um, I'm going to be talking today about the slipperiest phenomenon, intellectual phenomenon in her essay, having to do with what she called psychic ex excess. Uh, the, the charge or excess from the unconscious, which in some measure uh, unsettles even that which can be performed. We perform identity, we perform our subjectivity, we perform gender in all the ways that we'll be discussing in this lecture. But beyond what we can perform, there is sexuality, which I'm going to be turning to in a minute. And this has something to do with the uh, authentic realm of the unconscious from which it emerges. So what Butler did in her lecture yesterday was to return to the psychoanalytic aspect of the essay that you read for today, uh, emphasizing particularly the work of Lacan's disciple Jean Laplanche, uh, and, 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 and developing the ways in which um, sexuality uh, is something that belongs in a dimension that exceeds uh, and is less accessible than those more coded uh, concepts that we think of as gender uh, or as identity in general. Um, and so, um, conveniently enough, for those of you who did attend her lecture yesterday, in many ways she really did return to the issues that concerned her at the period of her career when she wrote Gender Trouble and when she wrote uh, the essay that, that you read for today. All right, now I do want to begin with what ought to be an innocent question. I mean, surely we, we, we're entitled to an answer to this question. <laughs> and the question is, what is sexuality? Right? Now, of course, you may be given pause, especially if you've got an ear fine-tuned to jargon, you may be given pause by the very word sexuality, which is obviously relatively recent in the language. People didn't used to talk about sexuality. They talked about sex, which you know, seems somehow more <laughs> straightforward. Um, but, the, but, but sexuality is a term uh, which is not only pervasive in cultural thought, uh, but also has a, a certain privilege among other ways of describing that aspect of our lives. In other words, there's something authentic, uh, as I've already begun to suggest, about our sexuality, something more authentic about that than uh, the sorts of aspects of ourselves that we can and do perform. That's, that's Butler's argument, uh, and it's an interesting starting point. But it's really not, it's, it's not yet or perhaps not at all, an answer to the question, what is sexuality? Now, for Foucault, sexuality uh, is arguably something like desired and experienced bodily pleasure. But the problem in Foucault is that this pleasure is always orchestrated by a set of factors uh, that surround it. Uh, a very complicated set of factors, which is arc articulated perhaps best um, on page 1634 in his text, uh, the lower right-hand column. He's talking about the difference between and the interaction between uh, what he calls the deployment of alliance and the deployment of, our word, sexuality. Uh, and I want to read this passage and then comment on it briefly. In a word, and it's of course not in a word, it's in several words, the deployment of alliance is attuned to a homeostasis of the social body. The deployment of alliance is the way in which in a given culture the nuclear reproductive unit is defined. 
typically as the family, but the family in itself changes in its nature and its structure. And the way in which the family is viewed, the sorts of activities that are supposed to take place and not take place in the family because Foucault lays a certain amount of stress on incest and the, and the atmospheric threat of incest, the sorts of things that go on in the family and are surrounded by certain kinds of discourse conveying knowledge um, – and we'll come back to, to, to the latter part of that sentence – all have to do with the deployment of alliance. The deployment of sexuality, uh, on the other hand, the deployment of sexuality we understand as the way in which whatever it, this thing is that we're trying to define uh, is talked about. Uh, and therefore, uh, not by any state apparatus or actual legal system necessarily, but nevertheless simply by um, the uh, the prevalence and force of various sorts of knowledge uh, policed. Okay, to continue the passage. In a word, the deployment of alliance is attuned to a homeostasis or regularization that's what, that's what he means by homeostasis of the social body, which it has the function of maintaining, whence its privileged link with the law. That is to say, the law tells us all, thi all sorts of things about the family, including whether or not there can be gay marriage, just incidentally. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Whence, too, the fact that the important phase for it is reproduction. The deployment of sexuality has its reason for being not in reproducing itself but in proliferating, innovating, annexing, creating, and penetrating bodies in an increasingly detailed way and in controlling populations in an increasingly comprehensive way. What he's saying is, among other things, that a deployment of sexuality, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, these deployments um, aren't meant somehow or another to be terroristic regimes. Uh, a deployment of sexuality, which for example favored forms of sexuality such as birth control or homosexuality, uh, would certainly be a means of controlling reproduction. That is to say, and, and, and just in that degree, the deployment of sexuality could be seen as subtly or not so subtly at odds with the deployment of alliance. Alliance, which is all for the purpose of reproduction, or at least takes as its primary sign, as Foucault suggests, the importance and centrality to a given culture or socio-biological system, if you will, of reproduction. And so this is the way, these are the ways in which the deployment of alliance and the deployment of sexuality converge, don't converge, conflict with each other. Uh, but in all of these ways, um, we keep seeing this concept of sexuality, but as I say, it continues to be somewhat elusive what precisely it is. Um, just to bracket that for the moment, uh, let me make another comment or two uh, on the concepts in the passage that I've just read. Let's say once for all at the outset that the central idea in Foucault's text, the idea of which he continues to develop throughout the three volumes on the history of sexuality. Uh, the, the central idea is this idea of power as something other than that which is enforced through legal policing or state apparatus means. Power which is enforced as a circulation or distribution of knowledge which is discursive in nature, which enforces its norms for all of us, for better or for worse, because discourse can release, can constitute sites of resistance as well as oppress, which for better or worse circulates among us ideas that are in a certain sense governing ideas about whatever it is that's in question, in this case, obviously, sexuality. So, and Foucault calls this sometimes, uh, hyphenating it, power knowledge. This is absolutely the central idea in late Foucault. Uh, I introduced it, you remember, last time in talking about Said. I come back to it now 
uh, as that which really governs and guides you through the whole text of Foucault. The distinction between power as it's traditionally understood as authoritative, as sort of top-down, coming from above, imposed on us by law, by the police, by whatever establishment of that kind there might be, the distinction between power of that kind uh, and power which is simply the way in which knowledge, and knowledge is not, by the way, necessarily a good word, it's not necessarily knowledge of the truth, but the way in which knowledge circulates and uh, imposes its effects on us. Behavior, the way we are, or the way at least that we think we are, uh, the way in which we perform in Butler's term, uh, all of that in Foucault is, 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 is uh, to be understood as an effect of power knowledge. Now, notice, however, in terms of our question, what is sexuality, that Foucault is being quite coy. He's talking about sexuality, but he's not talking about it in itself, whatever it in itself might be. He's talking about the deployment of it. That is to say, the way in which power knowledge constructs it, makes it visible, makes it available to us, makes it a channel through which desire can get itself expressed, but a channel which is still not necessarily in and of itself that natural thing that we look for and long for uh, and continue to seek the nature of sexuality. So the, it, when, the, it, when the emphasis in Foucault's discussion is really on deployment, that is the way in which alliance, the family, whatever the, whatever the nuclear social structure might be, or sexuality, whatever it is that gets itself expressed uh, as desire, uh, the way in which these, these, these matters, these aspects of our, uh, uh, of our lives can be deployed we still aren't necessarily talking about the thing in itself. Foucault isn't an anthropologist. He's not talking about the family in itself either. He's talking about the way in which a basic concept of alliance out of which reproduction arises and gets itself channeled can be deployed, understood as manipulated by the circulation of power knowledge. The issue of gay marriage is very interesting, by the way, between these con the, the concept of the deployment of alliance and the deployment of sexuality, because there's a certain sense in which the deployment of sexuality is at odds with the deployment of alliance. If, you know, if sexuality is something that is really just looking around for ways to get itself expressed, uh, you know, taking advantage of deployment where that's a good thing, trying to resist deployment where that seems more like policing, if it's just looking around for a way to get expressed, it's not particularly interested in alliance. It's not interested in the way uh, in, which, um, a, a, in which relationships involving se sexuality could, set her in, could settle into any kind of a coded pattern or system of regularity, so that there is this tension, which of course gets itself expressed whenever within the gay community uh, people strongly support gay marriage and see that as the, as the politicized center of contemporary gay life, or people also in the gay uh, community, many of them theoretically advanced, um, think of as a non-issue or a side issue which, 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 which loses track precisely of what Foucault calls the deployment of sexuality, simply trying to extend the domain, arguably a tyrannical domain, of the deployment of alliance. To extend, in, 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 other words, to, in other words, to redefine the basic concept of alliance in such a way that doesn't really touch very closely on the deployment of sexuality. So it's an interesting and rather mixed issue uh, that the whole question, the whole sort of profoundly politicized question of gay marriage gives rise to. So that's what sexuality is. <laughs> In Foucault. <laughs> in Butler, it's just clearer that 
to ask the question, what is sexuality, is, well, it's just been a false start. You know, we thought it was an innocent question, but whoa, you know, you get into you get into Butler and you and, and you see very clearly that you simply can't be a certain sexuality. You can perform an identity, as we'll see, by repeating, by imitating, by parodying in drag. You can perform an identity, but you can't wholly perform sexuality, precisely because of this element of psychic excess to which her thinking uh, continues very candidly and openly and honestly to return. Butler's work, in other words, is not just about the construction of identity. It's not just about uh, the domain of performance, as one might say. It acknowledges that there is something, something very difficult to grasp and articulate beyond performance. Its main business is to explain the nature and purview and purposes of performance, but it's nevertheless always clear in Butler uh, as she returns to the question of the unconscious in particular, that there is something uh, in excess of or not fully to be, uh, uh, to be encompassed by ideas of performance. Okay, so we've made a false start. We've asked a question we can't answer. But at the same time, we have learned certain things. We've learned certainly that sexuality, whatever it is, is more flexible and also in some sense more authentic, that is to say, closest to the actual nature of the drives. Yesterday uh, Butler made a distinction between instinct and drive, which I won't go into because it had to do with her reflections on what is cultural and what is uh, uh, biological or not cultural in the, in, in the life of the unconscious. But for our purposes, whatever role sexuality may play in the unconscious, uh, and however, that, however authentic, that is to say, however not culturally determined uh, that role may turn out to be, um, it's more flexible, and that's the important thing, than any kind of social coding. The sort of coding, for example, that, uh, that Foucault would uh, uh, intimate in speaking of alliance or deployed sexuality and the sort of coding that Butler refers to repeatedly as gendering. But still, for both of them, and this is the other thing we've learned, even sexuality through deployment or through the way in which it can get expressed in relation to gender and performance, even sexuality is discursive. It's a matter of discourse. It arises out of linguistic formations, formations uh, that Foucault understands as circulated knowledge and that Butler understands again as performance. Foucault sees sexuality as the effect of power knowledge, power as knowledge. Butler sees it as the effect uh, as it's insofar as it's visible, insofar as it is acted out sees it as the effect of performance. So now, to, to, take, to, to take the way in which Butler makes this relationship between what one might suppose to be authentic, actual, about oneself, and that which is performed, that which, that which is one's constructs to be a self, let's take the one of the most provocative sentences in her essay, which is on page 1711, about a third of the way down, since I was 16, being a lesbian is what I've been. Being a lesbian is what I've been. Now what she's doing, and re remember at the very beginning of the essay she says that her whole purpose is um, to reflect, is, is, is somehow or another to register a politicized intervention in gender studies in terms of a philosophical reflection on ontology, on being. What is it, in other words, she says, to be something? Now what she's doing in this sentence, which is 
an awkward seeming sentence. Being a lesbian is what I've been. What she's doing is pointing out to us that to be something is very different from to be being something. That for example, you know, I can say I'm busy. By the way, I am. <laughs> I can say I, I can say I'm busy, and I expect you to 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 take it that there's a certain integrity, there's a certain authenticity in the fact that I'm busy. Yes, I'm busy. But suppose you say, suspecting that I'm not really busy, suppose you say, oh, he's being busy. Right? In other words, he's performing busyness. He's going around being busy, you know, so imposing on me the idea that this lazy person is actually accomplishing something, right? So the performance of being busy. But here's the interesting point that Butler is making. The ontological realm is supposed to be about the simple being or existence of things, and it's always in philosophy contrasted with agency, with the doing of things, with getting something done, with the performance of things. But what Butler is saying, and that's why she says that she takes an interesting in the ontological aspect of the question, what she's saying is that there's an element of the performative which actually creeps into the ontological. Even being, she says, is something that in some measure, perhaps not altogether, but in some measure, something we perform. Hence the doublement, the doubling, the doubling up of the word being in the sentence, since I was 16, being a lesbian is what I've been. In one sense, yeah, I am. That's what I am. But in another sense, I've been performing it. I've been being <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I've been outing myself, if you will. I have been taking up a, a role that can be understood, as all roles can, um, intelligibly in terms of its performance. So that's the why she puts the sentence that way. And if you said, if you kind of made a big mark in the margin and said, aha, got her, right? This is where she says she really is something. No more of this stuff of just constructivism, you know, making, you know, making oneself up as one goes along. This is where she says she really is something. You're wrong. <laughs> She's escaped your criticism because she says, oh, no, no, no. It's be I, I have been being a lesbian. Right? I've been being one, which is a different thing, although not an altogether different thing <laughs> from being one. She is deliberately, in other words, on the fence between the sense of the ontological as authentic and her own innovative sense of the ontological as belonging within the realm of performance. Right? And she doesn't want to get off the fence. She, doesn't want, she, she really doesn't want to come down squarely on either side because for her, and this is what I like best about her work even though it's perhaps the most frustrating thing about it, because for her, what she is talking about is ultimately mysterious. She has a great deal to say about it, but she's not pretending that in what she has to say about it, she's exhausted the subject. That's why it seems to me to be admirable that she stays on the fence about this and not simply um, uh, you know, an occasion for our frustration. Come on, come out with it. I want to know what sexuality. No, no, it's fine, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, all right, so um, with all this said, it seems plain that, uh, and, and sort of mystification aside, if you will, as well, with all this said, it seems plain that Foucault and Butler do have a common political agenda. Foucault, a gay writer uh, who was uh, in the later stages of uh, writing the history of sexuality, um, dying of AIDS. Uh, uh, Butler, uh, a lesbian writer, both of them very much concerned for the political uh, implications of their marginalized gender roles, while at the same time, um, of course, being theoretically very sophisticated about them. Their common political agenda 
is to destabilize the heteronormative by denying the authenticity, or in Butler's parlance, originality of privileged gender roles. In other words, who says heterosexuality came first? Who says the nuclear family is natural? Who says sexuality uh, can only get itself expressed in certain ways that power knowledge deploys for it? Right. These are the sorts of questions, the, 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 the politicized questions, which these discourses uh, raise in common. Um, uh, so, in a, in a, in a, so it seems to me that they have a very broad agenda in common, and it also seems to me that they are very closely in agreement. And so, and, and I say that just in order to pause briefly on the moment in which they seem not to be. You, you probably noticed that um, one text is referring to another at one point in your reading, and so let's go there. Page 1712. The right hand a margin. Uh, and the context for this, of course, is Butler talking about Jesse Helms um, having deplored male homosexuality in attacking the photography of Robert Maplethorpe. Uh, and by implication, Butler argues, simply erasing female homosexuality because his diatribe pays no attention to it. And Butler then complains that there's a certain injustice in that um, because, in a way, it's even worse, she says, uh, to, to, to be declared non existent than it is to be declared deviant. Right? At least the male homosexual gets to be declared deviant. We're simply erased. That's the position she's taking here. And then at that point, and, sh what, and so what she says is, to be prohibited explicitly is to occupy a discursive site from which something like a reverse discourse can be articulated. To be implicitly proscribed is not even to qualify as an object of prohibition. And here's where she, she gives us a footnote on Foucault. Footnote 15. You know, we love footnotes. It is this particular ruse of erasure which Foucault, for the most part, fails to take account of in his analysis of power. Butler's argument is that in Foucauldian terms, there's got to be discourse for there to be identity. Right? Helms's refusal of the category of lesbian simply by omission, because, and, and of course we know, by the way, that this is a refusal <laughs> only by omission. Helms's refusal of this category is, at the se is, is, in other words, an erasure of discourse. No discourse, no identity. That is, in other words, what Butler is claiming Foucault's position entails. Discourse creates power knowledge. Power knowledge creates identity. Therefore, where there's no discourse, there can be no identity. And since Helms has erased the lesbian by refusing discourse about it, it must follow that there's no such thing as a lesbian. Right? That, 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 that's the implication of this footnote. He almost always presumes, and we must do honor to that word almost, almost always presumes that power takes place through discourse as its instrument. And that oppression is linked uh, and that oppression, sorry, is linked with subjection and subjectivization, that is, that it is installed as the formative principle of the identity of subject. All right. Now, in defense of Foucault. Let's go to page 1632, the upper right hand column. A passage that fascinated, uh, that's fascinating on a number of grounds. It's rather long, um, but I think I will read it. Upper right hand column. Foucault says Consider, for example, the history of what was once the great sin against nature, the extreme discretion of the texts dealing with sodomy that utterly confused category, and the nearly universal reticence in talking about it made possible a twofold operation. Okay, here's Foucault saying this is a category. The homosexual identity as uh, uh, understood in terms of sodomy is a category. He's, he's going to go on to say that it's, a, that it's punishable in the extreme by law. But in the meantime, he's saying, 
There's no discourse. There's a kind of almost universal silence on the subject. You don't get silence in Dante, as I'm sure you know, uh, but in most cases in this period, nobody talks about it. It's punishable, severely punishable by law, and yet nobody talks about it. This would seem to violate Foucault's own premise that discourse constitutes identity, uh, but also plainly does contradict Butler's claim that Foucault supposes that discourse always constitutes identity. So let's continue. The nearly <coughs> universal reticence in talking about it made possible a twofold operation. On the one hand, there was an extreme severity. Punishment by fire was meted out well into the 18th century without there being any substantial protest expressed before the middle of the century. Discourse is here failing uh, also in that it's not constituting a site of resistance. Nobody's complaining about these severe punishments, just as, on the other hand, nobody's talking very much about them. There is, in other words, an erasure of discourse. And, he continues, on the other hand, a tolerance that must have been widespread, which one can deduce indirectly from the infrequency of judicial sentences, and which one glimpses more directly through certain statements concerning societies of men that were thought to exist in the army or in the courts. In other words, he's saying there was an identity. And that identity was not, at least not very much, constituted by discourse. And he's going to go on to say, as you read down the column, he's going to go on to say that in a way the plight of the homosexual got worse when it started being talked about. Yes, penalties for being homosexual were less severe, but the surveillance of, of homosexuality, the way in which it could be um, sort of dictated to by therapy and by the clergy, and by everyone else who might have something to say about it, became far more pervasive and determinate than it was when there was no discourse about it. So that, um, in a certain way, Foucault is going so, on to, going so far as to say silence was, while perilous to the few, a good thing for the many. Whereas discourse, uh, which perhaps relieves the few of extreme fear, nevertheless so it imposes a kind of hegemonic uh, uh, authority on all that remain and constitutes them as something that power knowledge believes them to be rather than something that in any sense, according to their sexuality, they spontaneously are. So it seems to me that this point of disagreement with Foucault raised by Butler is answered in advance by Foucault. And that even there, when you think about it, they're really in agreement with each other. They are, you know, it is, it, 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 Foucault's, Foucault's position is more flexible than she takes it to be, but that just means that it's similar to her own. Uh, and as I say, so that, that uh, fact, together with the, the broad shared political agenda that they have, seems to me uh, to, uh, to suggest that they're writing very much in concert. Uh, and in keeping with each other's views. Now, in method, they are somewhat different. Foucault is a more historical writer, although historians uh, often criticize him for not being historical. Uh, nevertheless, at that is, I mean, the reason who, who historians don't think he's historical is that he never really explains how you get from one moment in history to the next. He talks about moments in history, but he talks about them in terms of, of bodies of knowledge, epistemic moments, as he sometimes says. Uh, and then these moments somehow mysteriously become other moments, are transformed, and the kind of causality that might explain such a thing, uh, from an historian's point of view, tends in Foucault's argument to be left out. He nevertheless is concerned, however, with the way in which views of things change over time, and it's the change in those views that his argument in the history of sexuality tends to concentrate on. So that he can say that starting in the 19th century and continuing to the present, there are essentially four cathected beings around which uh, power knowledge 
uh, deploys itself. And he describes them uh, as the hysterical woman, the masturbating child, the Malthusian couple, meaning the couple who is enjoined not to reproduce too much because the economy won't stand for it. That's the which is a way of, you see, of deploying alliance in such a way as to manipulate and control reproduction. Uh, that's a moment, by the way, in which the deployment of alliance and the deployment of sexuality may be in league with each other because obviously birth control and homosexual practices can also control reproduction. So, so as you see, it's not always a question of conflict between, uh, between these, these, uh, these two forms of deployment. So in any case, and, uh, the Malthusian couple and the perverse adult, meaning the queer person in whatever form. Uh, and he says about this on page 1634 in the left-hand column, you get, you, you, you get these four types, uh, and he says that therapy, the clergy, family, parental advice, the various ways in which knowledge of this kind circulates have to do primarily with the preoccupation with, tension about, anxiety about these four types. The hysterical woman is, this, is determined to be hysterical once, her whole, once, once it begins to be thought that her whole being is her sexuality. The masturbating child violates the idea that children are born innocent. Uh, is both is is both so so and 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 must because it suggests you know something terribly wrong about the uh, the cult of the innocent child that begins in the 19th century is something that is subject to extreme and severe surveillance. Who knows what will come of this? Uh, scientific thinking about masturbation <coughs> had to do with the fact with the notion that it led to impotence. That you know by the time you get around. Um, you, you got around to being in a relationship, there wouldn't be anything there anymore, uh, just terrible thoughts. Also, it stunted your growth, you died sooner, you know, it's just, just terrible, terrible thoughts about masturbation. All of this uh, dominated the scientific literature until well into the 20th century. Uh, the, um, and, and, and then the Malthusian couple, um, which was primarily a phenomenon of what's called political economy in the earlier 19th century, but has uh, prevailed, by the way, um, in, in what we suppose to be, and, and indeed what is, our progressive uh, technology of the promotion of birth control around the world. Uh, we must control population is still the Malthusian principle on which we base the idea that people really need to be enlightened about the possibility of not just having an infinite number of children. Um, and so uh, again you see that Foucault is right still to suppose that the, the notion of the Malthusian couple uh, prevails, prevails among us. And then finally the perverse adult uh, who is first discoursed about in the 19th century as the earlier passage that I read suggested and is still, of course, widely discoursed about, and of course now has a voice, discourses uh, in its own right, um, a literature, uh, you know, sort of, a, 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 sort of a, a journalism and all the rest of it, uh, and uh, is, in other words, very much in the mainstream of discourse and still has controversy swirling around it precisely because of the discursive formations that attach to it. So all of this uh, Foucault takes to be in the nature of historical observation. For Butler, on the other hand, uh, as you can tell from her style, I'm sure that as in the case of reading Baba, you recognize a lot of Derrida in Butler's style. Uh, in Butler, it's a question of taking these same issues and orienting them more in the direction of philosophy. I've already suggested the way in which she understands this particular essay as a contribution to that uh, uh, branch of philosophy called ontology, the philosophy of being. Uh, and in general, uh, she takes a particular and acute interest in that. And what she does, I think by the, I mean her basic move is something that I hope by this time you've become familiar with and recognize and perhaps even anticipate. Uh, for us, perhaps the uh, inaugural move of this kind uh, were the various distinctions uh, made by Levi Strauss, uh, the one that I mentioned in particular, 
uh, as accessible and I think immediately explanatory of how the move works is the raw and the cooked. Uh, and I, 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 I tried to show that intuitively, obviously, the raw precedes the cooked. <laughs> you know, first it's raw, then it's cooked. Uh, and yet at the same time, if we understand the relationship between the raw and the cooked to be a discursive formation, we have to recognize that there would be never there'd be no such thing as the raw if there weren't the cooked. You have to, I mean, if if you talk about eating a raw carrot, you have to have had a cooked carrot. I mean, you can't, you know, you don't you, you don't just pick up a carrot which 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 you've never seen before and say, this is raw. The only way you know it's raw is to know that it can be and has been cooked. Well, this is the butler move, the move that she, she makes again and again and again. What do you mean the heterosexual precedes the homosexual? What do you mean the, the heterosexual is an original and the homosexual is just a copy of it? Who would ever think of the concept of the heterosexual? The heterosexual? You know, you, you, you're you the only person on earth and you stand there and you say, I'm heterosexual? <laughs> no, you, know, you don't do that. You just say, well, I'm, I have sexuality, right? You could say that if you had enough jargon at your disposal, you, but you, you could say that. But you can't say, I'm heterosexual. You can't have the concept heterosexual without having the concept homosexual. They are absolutely mutually dependent. And what, it, and, this, and it has nothing to do with any possible truth of, uh, of, or, 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 of a chicken and egg nature, you know, wi- a, a, as to what came. In sexuality, uh, the, supp- the very strong supposition is for Butler, neither came first. They're always already there together uh, um, in that psychic excess uh, with which we identify sexuality. But in social terms, the idea that what's natural is the heterosexual and what's unnatural, secondary, derivative, uh, imitative of the heterosexual is the homosexual is belied simply by the fact that you can't have one conceptually without, without the other. And it's the same thing with gender and drag. Drag comes along and parodies, mimics, imitates gender, but what it points out is that gender is always in and of itself precisely performance. I, you know, I, anybody, uh, uh, this could of course take the form of a critique, I suppose, but we're all quite virtuoso when it comes to performing. Here I am, I'm, I'm standing in front of you performing professionalism. I'm performing whiteness. I'm performing masculinity. I'm doing all of those things. I'm quite a virtuoso, you know. I mean, what a performance! Um, <laughs> and 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 uh, and, and s- so perhaps it's it's kind of hard to imagine my standing here, sort of exclusively performing masculinity, as opposed to all the other things that I'm performing. But okay, I'm certainly doing that too, and I'm insecure about all these things. Butler argues because I keep performing. In other words, I keep repeating what I suppose myself to be. I don't just, I'm not comfortable in my skin, presumably, and I don't just relax into what I suppose myself to be, I perform it. Uh, it, is, it is, in other words, a perpetual self-construction construction, which does two things at once. It stabilizes my identity, which is its intention, but at the same time it betrays my anxiety about my identity in that I must perpetually repeat it to keep it going. Right? And so all of this is going on in this notion of performance. So what drag does is precisely bring all this to our attention. It shows us you know, once for all that that's what's at stake in the seemingly natural categories of gender that we imagine ourselves to inhabit. Uh, like a pair, like a set of comfortable old clothes. Uh, drag, which is not at all comfortable old clothes, <laughs> reminds us how awkward, <laughs> you know, are the apparel of ourselves that we can call our identity actually is. Um, and so it plays that role, and the relationship between identity and performance is just the same. This notion of performing identity should recall for you signifying. 
in the thinking of Henry Louis Gates, it should, call, it should recall for you, in other words, the way in which the identity of another is appropriated through parody, through derision, through self-distancing, through uh, a sense of the way in which one is something precisely uh, insofar as one is not simply inhabiting the subject position of another. It should also recall for you uh, the sly civility of the subaltern in Homi Bhava's thinking, the way in which double consciousness is partly uh, in the subject position of another, partly in one's own in such a way that one liberates oneself from the sense that it's the other person who's authentic and that one is oneself somehow derivital, de de derivative, uh, subordinate, uh, dependent. Uh, and so all of these relations uh, ought to uh, gel in your minds as belonging very much to the same sphere of thought. Uh, the, way in the, the way in which uh, the, you can't have the raw without the cooked is the way in which, generally speaking, categories of self and other, of identity per se, simply can't be thought in stable terms in and for themselves, but only relationally. Now, oh boy, why is this literary theory? <laughs> you ask yourself. You have been asking yourself. Very quickly, and of course, Butler gives the greatest example at the end uh, of her essay when she says, suppose Aretha is singing to me. Uh, you make me feel not a natural woman because there's no such thing as a natural. You make me feel like a natural woman, you presumably being some heteronormative other who shows me what it is really to be a woman. But suppose Aretha is singing to me, or suppose she's singing to a drag queen. Right? That is reading. That's reading uh, a, 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 a song text uh, in a way that is precisely literary theory. Now, obviously I'm thinking of Virginia Woolf's Mr. Ramsey in writing this sentence. It's a terrible sentence for which I apologize. Virginia Woolf never would have written it. Um, but, but, just, but just to pass in review the way in which what, which we've, what we've been doing is literary theory, the Marxist critic would, of course, focus on his because the nexus for the Marxist critic in this sentence would be possession, that is to say, the deployment of capital such that uh, a, a, a strategy of possession can be enacted. The African-American critic would call attention to white color-coded metaphors, insisting, uh, in other words, that one of the ways in which literature needs to be read is through a demystification of processes of metaphorization, whereby white is bright and sunlit and, 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 and central, and black, as Toni Morrison suggests in her essay, is an, is an absence, is a negation, is a negativity. This is bad, a dark mood. For the post-colonialist critic, obviously the problem is an expropriated but also undifferentiated commodity. Who? Oriental. You don't mean Oriental, you mean Kazakh or Bukhara or Kilim or any number of other possible. In, in, in other words, the very lack of specificity in the concept uh, suggests the, uh, the reified or objectified other uh, in the imagination or consciousness of the discourse. And finally, uh, for gender theory, uh, the masculine anger of the philosopher, Mr. Ramsey, you remember he could so frustrated because he can't get past R, he wants to get S, he can't get past R. The masculinized anger of the philosopher masks the effeteness of the aestheticism of somebody who has an oriental rug, and that in turn might mask, you know, the, the effete professorial type might mask uh, all an altogether too heteronormative sexual predation, and on and on and on dialectically if you read this sentence as uh, uh, an aspect or element of gender theory. Okay, I will certainly end there, uh, and next time we'll take up the way in which what we've been talking about for a few lectures, the construction of identity of things, which has obviously been one of the common features of this course.
is theorized at, at an even more abstract level with certain conclusions. 